and all the time. Thank you, Pastor Ben. It's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, back back at my home church, I I tend the parking lot. They don't allow me to go in the pulpit, <laughs> except for welcoming. So, brother Jimmy, you know that's where I start to I'd give an announcements, and then you'll be preaching the word the same way. Yeah, Amen. Let me give you an update. Let me go with the Mia. I mean MIA. I've been MIA for uh, almost uh, eight months. Yeah, for the from the ministry. I just started recently coming back. Uh, as you probably know, I've um, I've shut. We've closed down one business in Waikiki just at the uh, end of the first month of this year, and then without breathing, you know, something came along, and uh, we opened up another business. We took over a business in uh, Iaia. And uh, we opened up in March, so there was no breathing room. And all that time, we, you know, although I've been in business for over 20 plus years, with all that experience, you you think it would be easy, right? But it was just starting from scratch all over again, new menu, new places, new faces, and it wasn't easy, you know. It was not easy. Uh, it was a uh, uh, exhausting. Every day, it's the grind. In fact, the name of the business is New Town Asian Grinds, and that grinds is grinding every day, you know, 14 to 16 hours every day, almost seven days. I did not give up going to church on Sundays. I honored the Lord uh, every Sunday, still going to church. And uh, my uncle, who's uh, one, my, one of my partners, one the partner, uh, honored that, and he allowed me to go, and then I would take the night shift on Sunday. You know, it's been quite a new adventure. Uh, I can't say it was easy, but uh, it was all steps of faith all steps of faith there's a lot of changes a lot of challenges and and no doubt there was a lot of prayer i remember uh, the first month uh, every day it was like wow so much work so much time invested and so many new things yeah we we were so unorganized it was uh, chaotic to say the the best of it it was chaotic things were in the wrong place the mac salad was over there the rice was over there and you know to make a plate have to run over there to get the mac salad and and the worst case was the mac salad wasn't consistent and the rice was you know it was so many things it was just chaotic but slowly and slowly but surely uh through god's grace we're able to reorganize and improve and day by day that was one of my models to you know like uh every day improve a little bit and, you know, soon everything will work well. Now, you know, fast forward seven, eight months later, we're much more stable. Uh, it's not as busy as I was like. You know, the first two months we were actually pretty busy. I guess because it's a new place and everybody's like, you know, want to try. And, you know, and then that was good. And then, you know, slowly business started tapering off. And that's fine too. You know, you know that was the honeymoon of the business because everybody want to try. And now it's the building time, slowly building. And, and the Lord is gracious, yeah. And we sustain. We have no debt. You know, praise God. We, you know, we're able to run. I mean, you know, if you ever learn about business, people lose money the first two years. We have not lost money. In fact, we were. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, hey, these are patrons. Uh, that's a, my cheap plug right there. No, <laughs> people have come. Please come and try. But you know, anyway, uh, it's it's been a challenge, and it's still a challenge. You know, I'm still praying for God. You know, his direction. For the business itself because you know it takes a lot of my time but praise god you know saturdays i'm able to come out now you know just started going back to the park and helping out over there and you know if it's not for a wedding or a funeral or something i you know i can come you know and, and, and i'm glad i'm here praise god praise god well you know god how many know that god has a sense of humor you know we were made in his image right <laughs> so we can laugh he can laugh too and, uh, you know, earlier this week, uh, I texted Pastor Ben. I said, oh, I'm like a few days early. I'm going to text him and tell him what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, so I texted him, well, Pastor, I'm going to talk about uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. That's, that's the, what God gave me. And then uh, Pastor Ben texts me back and says, uh, oh, brother, um, that's what I preached on last week. Uh, does God have a sense of humor or what? So I prayed about it. I told Pastor Ben, I'll pray about it. I said, maybe I'm lagging in the spirit or something. You know, maybe it's going slow mode. Uh, the, it's buffering and I'm not receiving it fast enough. But I still believe that God has given me uh, that, that scriptures in that, in, in that uh, book. But uh, i also going to expound on other things. Yeah. Well, that's my update. Uh, 14, 16 hour days. And I still do that some days. But it's a lot better now. We have a little bit more help. And we've kind of like split up our schedules. And, and so God is good. God is good. 
All right, praise God. Okay, you're going to have to bear with me. You guys are the guinea pig because this is the first time I'm going to be preaching twice in one day. That's amazing because I barely get to preach once a day. So anyway, uh, let me jump into the scripture. If I can find it here. Okay, that was page one. That's page two. I'm looking for page three. Praise God. Oh, the title of my sermon is Disappointment. Now, you could describe it several ways. You know, uh, if, if we, dis, if we uh, get the meaning from the dictionary, disappointment, is the meaning is, is, is a feeling of sadness or, or displeasure caused by a non-fulfillment of one's hopes of expectation. How many of you guys have experienced disappointment? How many of you guys have this, felt that this morning? How many of you are sitting next? Oh, no, don't even go there. Don't look at your neighbor. Do not look at your neighbor. I separate this title as this, and then there's a you know, dash appointment because, you know, there's also appointments, like this appointment. You know, I, in the back of my mind, when I found out Pastor Ben preached about the, the same scriptures, I, 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 I said, oh, maybe I should call him, postpone him, yeah? Well, the Bible says, that your yes be yes and your no be no, man. Everything else is from the devil. Let's just keep our appointments and trust God that he has a word. Amen? Amen. You know, um, experiencing, talking about experiencing disappointment, maybe you're disappointed about how life is not what you have pictured it. I mean, when we were young, maybe as a girl, well, I don't know how a girl feels, but, or, or a guy, you would picture your life a certain way. Maybe you've seen, you know, in the movies or maybe in the family, you know, but it might not, you know, now, now that you're this age, you say, wow, it's not, not what I really pictured it. You, you might be a little bit disappointed. Maybe even your marriage now was, wasn't all that you expected, you know. After the honeymoon, it's like, oh, is that all there is? Well, you mean I take out the garbage, dishes, kids? You mean I have to help and raise them too? Wow. Or maybe at this age and stage, you figure, I'd be a little bit more healthier. I didn't know that. You know, uh, I remember this, uh, sorry, I'm digressing. Uh, when I used to work in Waikiki, I would drive home and I would take Macaulay, yeah? And on that corner, there's a, there's a rent a center place and that corner right before the bridge. And there was one saying, it says, uh, midlife is, is when your, your narrow waist trades places with your broad mind. Now, if you don't get it, it's like, you know, one is. And, you know, maybe, you, you know, your health is, is not as what you have pictured it. And maybe even your finances is not what you hoped it to be. You know, when I was in Waikiki, uh, business was, was good. But the last few years, was, it was not, not so good. And then, praise God in the sense that, you know, our lease ended and we had to get out of there. But, you know, as I look in the retrospect, I got paid better over there than what I do over here. Although the rent was like, you know, way, way higher over there. And it was somewhat easier because I had more employees now you know it's me myself and I and my uncle and uh, we're doing everything you know we're doing everything and so maybe a little bit of disappointment there is not not what I pictured it to be and then there's things in our lives that are out of our control let me talk to you about some of those you cannot control your height now I'm not saying that stand on a chair and you're taller you can't control that right well you can control your weight yeah Okay, I'm not going to go there. Shh. You cannot control who your parents are or who you were birthed by. But you can choose your spouse, yeah? Don't look at your spouse right now. You love her and you love him. God put you together. You cannot control the siblings that you have. You can pick your friends, yeah? You can hang out with you know, who you want to hang out with. You cannot control your gender. Now, you can get an operation. I don't suggest it. But you can control how you behave, right? You can't control. Some things uh, in our lives uh, we just can't control. Now, I want to talk to you uh, a, a little bit about in Genesis. Uh, I want to talk about infertility, barrenness. Barrenness is just not, not being able to produce. Or and, and the reason why I'm sticking with this message is because I was driving on Friday. Uh, I took the morning shift and then the night shift I have off. I, I was listening to the radio and I think it was focused on the family or something and it had a special speak guest uh, interview and the girl was talking about you know being born without a uterus and I said okay that's clear 
I guess uh, her barrenness, you know, confirmed that I should talk about this. Now, I want to talk about Abraham, Abram and Sarai, which I'm going to say Abraham and Sarah, so you guys don't get mixed up. Their names change eventually, yeah? Sarah was, was barren, yeah? She's one of the women who's barren. And uh, that's a difficult thing, especially I mean, way at the beginning and even, even today, especially Asians and other cultures. You know, after you marry, they expect something, yeah? Especially the in-laws, right? Like, you know, when are you going to give me grandchildren and all that kind of stuff? And uh, to not have it, it's uh, looked upon like a curse almost, like what you did wrong, you know, what kind of sin are you hiding, yeah? And so for, for a- Abraham and Sarah, it, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. But, you know, as we look into uh, uh, Genesis, yeah, uh, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. You know, it's amazing that I can see the little words on my Bible. I have this tiny Bible here that has all the words, but I... I have to take off my glasses to see it. How many of you uh, have that problem? <laughs> okay, Genesis 15. See, Ab- Ab- Abraham was given a promise. It was a covenant promise with God. It says, from verse 1, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son is coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can't count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and it was, it was credited to him as righteousness. That's one of my brother's favorite verses, yeah? How many knees would be shaken if God says, uh, your offspring would be as much as the stars in the sky? You know, I, my, my legs would be shaking because I know how expensive it is to raise a child. So God had promised Abram in the vision and showed him that, you know, he, he told him. And this is way before, you know, this problem with uh, uh, being barren, yeah? So, you know, after... Uh, Abram, Abraham and Sarah gets married, you know. After 10 years or so, you know, you probably expect something to come about, yeah? So, after this kind of time, uh, I, I was reading and I only found this out recently. There's this thing called the Mishnah, the oral, written, oral law, the Jewish law. It says that after 10 years of, of marriage and you have no kid, uh, the guy gets to uh, find another wife to bear children because they want to so-called fulfill the commandment be fruitful and multiply but i think that's that's what man did but you know because in the beginning genesis god talked about you know you shall leave your mother and your father and go cleave to your wife not wives wife so you know men be clear on that yeah so um so sarah takes this matter into her own hands as we you you probably already know you know, she says, how am I going to build a family, you know? We've got to continue the lineage, and that's important in the day, yeah? And so uh, she says, you know, take, take my maidservant, Hagar, and, and lie with her. I'll give him to you uh, for your wife, and then you have kids, and then that way we have a family lineage. She took the matter into her own hands, and a- Abraham already knew that there was a promise, but he gives in and, and goes with it anyway. And Ishmael was born, right? And now to this day, you know that Ishmael and Isaac and just uh, all the turmoil, that, that this, the dysfunction that came from this, yeah? Um, so Ishmael was born. And then not till I, I read, uh, researched it, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor Ben, not until like 39 years later was, uh, did, was uh, Sarah able to bear a child. And uh, prior to that, a year before that, uh, there was the three visitors, yeah? And, and in the Bible, it talks about the it's two angels and, and the Lord visiting Abraham. And I don't know how he would have recognized. Maybe it was very bright or he would dress differently. But, you know, when he saw them while he was hanging out in front of his tent by the trees, you know, he went there, pre- prepped food for them, washed their feet and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, stay, eat and all that. And in the end, uh, uh, it says that, you know, it reaffirmed that promise to him that by t- this time next year, Sarah is going to have a kid. And Sarah's in the back saying, 
Yeah, I'm, not, I'm 90 years old. Bush was 94, yeah? Can you imagine pregnant Bush? 94. And she's, she's 90 years old. But lo and behold, God's promise was fulfilled. Right? A year later, it happened. That's a miracle, right? She was past the age of childbearing, man. I mean, it would be amazing even at 50 or 45, 50, 60. I, I've heard uh, somewhere there's a lady in India, you know, 60 something, gave birth. Uh, that's pretty amazing, right? Not common, right? But 90s in your 90s? Wow. And then, yeah, Abraham was 100 years old. He was like, oh, come here. <laughs> you know, how you take care of a kid? I have a hard time at this age taking care of my young kids. Next, we'll talk about Isaac and Rebecca. We're going down the line over here, right? Isaac was the was their kid, right? The, the other kid, right? We have Ishmael. Ishmael, you know, became nation, and God has blessed them, and he was sent away, made his nation. But now it's Isaac and Rebecca, and you, you see, it's, it's kind of like it's almost following suit over here. There's one generation right into the next generation, right? And, and uh, also, she was barren too. Rebecca was barren. I, I couldn't find how long she was barren for, but it must have been quite a while. Uh, the good thing about this couple is they, they didn't seek an, uh, an outside help. See, they didn't you know, look for another woman to, you know, and so forth. Uh, I read that uh, Isaac was about 60 years old when uh, they bore twins. So they waited about, I think, 20 years actually. Yeah. They waited about 20 years. That's a long time, you know. How many of you guys could pray for 20 years day and night before conceiving? It's, it's, it's hard, very difficult, yeah? It's, it's not, not easy. But they remained faithful. And so they were able to birth two. two. And this kind of reminds me of my, my own personal story. Um, we, me and my wife, we had... We had that kind of problem, you know, and it was hard to talk about because, you know, as a guy, you say, you know, you, you perform and it happens and, you know, out comes the baby. But it didn't happen for us. We, we wanted to have kids at the same time our friends had kids. They, they got married earlier and then uh, we're about the, we're the same age and then we wanted to have kids about the same time. And it just didn't happen, you know, and we struggled, struggled. And then uh, it was God's timing. One day I just went to visit my friend and uh, he owned a uh, automotive shop. And I went there and uh, I guess it was changed oil that did something. And we just we started talking and I don't know how we got into the subject. And then he asked me, hey, you guys, you know, did you, you know, are you seeing a doctor or something like that and check up like that? So he recommended, you know, maybe for my wife to go see a, the the gynecologist, right? Just to see everything, the system is okay. And then after she sees it, if she's okay, then it would be my turn. So, you know, push her first, yeah, under the bus. So uh, so that's what we did. Because, you know, frankly, after a year or so, it, you get kind of tired, like, you know, it's not fun anymore in the sense that you're trying to, you know, have a baby and it, it doesn't come about. Every time the strip says, oh, it's not. And those strips are expensive, yeah. Pake is it's very expensive, you know. Say, Lord, you're running me dry there. So I remember going that day, uh, taking her, uh, sitting in our room uh, at the gynecologist. There was pregnant women. There was kids running around. And my wife went in. I sat outside, you know, just read the magazine. And so after the appointment, I remember she came out. And then, you know, we were just ready to leave. Uh, she was talking to the front desk a little bit, got some papers. And as we were walking down the hall, she says, honey, I'm pregnant. I said, yeah, right, you know. Why, why, you, yeah, you're right. We just kept walking. I didn't believe her. And then she, she grabbed my hand. She says, no, I am pregnant. Here's the prenatal prescription. Whoa! She was four months pregnant into a pregnancy. We didn't know. And she actually had dental work scheduled, you know, soon. Like, you know, the kind of deep dental work, which, you know, x-rays and all kind of stuff would have been really bad. But God was gracious. And lo and behold, 12 years later, my son is 12 years old. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. The next set of, uh, the, next, the next lineage, I'm going through the patriarchs all the way down now. You know, the father of Abraham, the father of Isaac and Jacob. It's Jacob and Rachel. Now, this was a fiasco family. It's not Jacob and Rachel. It was Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. As you remember, 
uh, Jacob, you know, stole the birthright, right? He deceived, right? Deceives the dad, Isaac, you know, put on the clothes. And the mom helped her. There was a lot of favoritism there, you know. And then Isaac went, bless him. And then Esau come back, what about my blessing? What about my blessing? And uh, Jacob had to run. And mom said, run to Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban has a ranch down the road. So, you know, because uh, your brother Esau is going to mock at you, man. So you better go. So he went. And over there, he met Rachel. Yeah. The Bible describes uh, Leah and Rachel. Leah was the older daughter of Laban, and Rachel was the younger one. Le Poor Leah, she had she had lazy eyes. It's kind of like I don't know. Some actresses have it. It's like you know, it looked tired eyes. Yeah, not not as pretty to look at because women like bigger eyes. Yeah? They put mascara and all that just to heighten it. And uh, anyway, and then Rachel was 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 beautiful. The Bible even describes that. Yeah, I even uh, mark my Bible for that. It says, uh, yeah, Leah had weak eyes, it says, in, the, in the Genesis 29, uh, verse, verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters, the name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Wow. I guess that's what caught <laughs> Jacob's eye, yeah? Uh, give it a regular guy, right? Catch by the eye. And so, you know, he was willing to work for her, for, for, La for her, yeah, through Laban, yeah. Seven years, right? And you know how he got deceived, right? Right? Yeah. The night of the wedding, bro, I guess they, I guess like it's like in the Asian culture, man. They put on the, the veil and all that, and, you know, it's late, it's dark, everybody partied and all that. Somewhere along the way, Leah and Rachel must have switched somewhere. I don't know where. And, uh... When uh, Jacob woke up next day and there was light, he says, say what? <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. What is this you have done to me, Laban? I asked for Rachel and you gave me a name. Oh, it's not in our custom, he says, you know, to marry away the younger daughter before the older. Didn't you read the fine print? No. So the deceiver, Jacob, got deceived. But, for another seven years, you can have Rachel. So after the week was over, guess what? You got Rachel. But this is hard, you know. Can you imagine being Leah? Can you imagine? You feel like a throwaway, right? You got shoved into this. You know Jacob didn't love you, right? He always googly eye for Rachel. And Leah has the weak eyes. You can just imagine, right? And then, you know, the Bible describes that, that, that Leah was not loved by Jacob because Jacob it wasn't in a sense Jacob's fault but God saw it and what did God do God allow her to conceive kid after kid after kid I think it was four yeah Pastor Ben was there about four kids four kids on the four one by one by one and Rachel's womb was closed I don't know for what reason but it was closed was closed page seven goes to page eight okay. so her womb was closed and when when you read into this story it's it's quite the drama and 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 soap opera edition right so after she has the four kids and rachel's like jealous remember they're sisters now they grew up with each other it's hard right even brother rivalry sister rivalry it, it's difficult you know, you know him from young time. And it's like, wow, you gave him my man and, you know, and this and that and all that. Oh, it's a call from the Lord. <laughs> and so so it goes on. And, and uh, so uh, uh, Rachel tries to do it her way, right? How does she try to do it her way? She sends uh, her maidservant, right? Hey, take my maidservant as your wife. Maybe perhaps I can, you know, get a kid from, from, from her. And then, you know, I can build my lineage, you know, and get redeemed and vindicated from all of this. And so that happens, and two kids pop out of that. And then uh, uh, Leah's womb was, was closed after four kids. But then she takes her maid servant. Hey, take him, take her, take her to be your wife and have some kids on, on my behalf. 
This is a fiasco. This is not, I don't believe this is God's will or God's plan. This is man's way. You see the, just uh, the emotions involved, yeah? Like, yeah, you go, you sleep with her, and you sleep with her, and you have kids. And, and Jacob's like, okay, whatever, you know. And uh, lo and behold, many kids. It wasn't until a lot later that uh, Rachel finally, her womb was finally open, right? It was closed, it was finally open. And she bore, of course, the infamous Joseph. And the sad thing is, like, when she, she bore the very last one, uh, Benjamin, the original name that, that, uh, that the, the, the wife wanted was uh, Ben o Onai or something like that. It meant, like, you know, troubled son or something like that. But uh, Jacob named him Benjamin, which is a better name. And she died giving birth on that. It's so amazing, yeah, this... These, these things that happened, uh, it's, it's not in their control in the sense that, that when your womb is closed, you know. The Bible says that what, what God closes, no one can open. And what God opens, no one can close. And you can just imagine all, all this stuff going on. And, and, and uh, you can read about it. I invite you to read about it. You know, the, the Bible, what I really love about the Bible is as you read it, it, it doesn't hide these things. It doesn't try to sweep it under the rug. It tells you how it is yeah and it is that that it's the truth right this is what happened and you can read about it and uh it, it makes no apologies for it it tells you this is what happened now is it what god wanted to happen uh, you might say well he is sovereign he allowed it to happen but it was, i don't believe it was his way but even how many know that even through our mistakes our bad choices god can still steer and orchestrate our lives in the way he wants us to go so it does us good to, to kind of listen, yeah? But all these things is, is, is out of their control. Out of their control. Now, now I'm going to move into the, the, about Hannah. Hannah, you guys already, if you were, how many of you were here last week? How many of you were last week? Okay. All right, we got some new audiences. So not, everybody, not everybody has heard about it. And the situation with Hannah was the same thing where, you know, she, she was not able to bear children. And again, after 10 years, you know, Elkanah, the husband, took another wife, Penaniah, and uh, she was having babies left and right. And Hannah had none. Was it her fault? No. Now, I want you to kind of step in her shoes a little bit. Can you imagine? Now, okay, guys, I invite you to be in your, touch your feminine side this morning, you know. Go in your feminine side this morning. I know it's hard. Yeah. As a woman might understand, a man might not. Let's get in touch with our feminine side this morning. Imagine you were Hannah, okay? The first year, marriage. Oh, everything's great, man, you know? Elkanah, he's doing good, you know? Everything's going good. Business is good. No kids. No one to think anything of it. Probably, you know, go to church, whatever. Hey, how's everything? Good, good, good. Oh, no kid yet, but, you know, okay. Two years down the line, now people are starting to question because back in the day, I don't think they did birth control, you know? people get married and they have kids you know that's the thing to do you know three years down the road walking down the market hey uh hannah how's it going are you guys planning to have some you know friend friend from church or whatever <sighs> four years five years down the line same thing running somebody in the supermarket the kosher supermarket how you doing hannah hey you know, and, and she probably sees her friends with a bunch, you know, one in the, one in the stroller, one in the back, you know, one in the cart. And uh, still, she has none. Ten years, nine, eight years, nine years, ten years. Can you picture the ridicule that she might receive even from neighbors and friends and family, like questioning, what's up with Hannah? The gossip that might have gone around, you know, the rumors. How come Hannah not having kids like that? You know, what's wrong with her? Funny how the Bible doesn't talk about the guy, yeah? What if the guy was shooting blanks? Right? I'm not going to even go there. Like, what if, right? But it talks about the woman, right? So after 10 years, okay, Elkanah takes a second wife. Again, it's from the Mishnah where the Jewish oral traditions that after 10 years, if you don't conceive, you can... It's almost, they, they say it's your obligation to take another wife so you can procreate. You can be fruitful and multiply. Again, I don't think this is God's will. Genesis t- tells us already. So you can see all the stuff that she would deal with. Now, 
every year they will go to silo yeah that's the place shiloh that's where they would worship I, I guess they don't have like churches all over the place and they have a designated place where they go and so that every year they make that trek to make their now aren't you glad you know you don't have to like fly somewhere to go to church every sunday or go somewhere real far but they did they did every year sacrifices offerings and they would all go and would what should have been a happy time, a rejoicing time, a time of worship and thanksgiving became a, a nightmare, a fiasco because Panina, the other, the sister wife, is that correct? Sister wife? The, <laughs> the sister wife, she was a meanie. She provoked Hannah. She has all these kids, right? But you know why? Because Elkanah showed more love to Hannah. Was it his fault? I don't know. He didn't show the same love to her, even though she bore kids for him. So year after year this went on. The scripture says on the verse 4 on the Samuel 1, Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat. To his wife Penina and to also to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. God did this. You scratch your head, you can't understand it. Why would she why would God do that, right? God did it. He has a purpose. But Hannah was loved greatly by her husband. And I'm sure Penina, you know, she she saw it. Right? It was like openly displayed, right? She gets double and, you know, her kids and her and her kids only had, had the, the regular. So can you imagine all this going year after year after year? Imagine your Hannah, yeah? And every year, same thing. She chooses that, that time. And I'm sure other times as well, but more, more in the scriptures where they talk about every year when they go, her rival, it says her rival, rival sounds very like against, yeah? Provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Year after year this gone on. Now let me ask you, if you were Hannah and you had to deal with the sister wife year after year, I mean what you know, what would you do? What would you do and then repent? <laughs> right? I know what I would do. I mean, you know, that's it's a, it wouldn't be a nice thing like Man, I, I just I just had it with you're provoking and you're irritating, you're taunting me all the time that I, I ain't got it, you know. God didn't put it in me. What's wrong with you, you know, sort of thing. And year after year, she would have to deal with that. But the amazing thing about Hannah is she was gracious. It never once mentioned in the Bible about Hannah retaliating. She cried before the Lord, right? She sought the Lord wept bitterly kind of probably like david where you know the the tears on my pillows are is my food you know like day and night i'm crying because i I'm, i don't feel fulfilled i you know i believe that I, I you know i want to be a mother i want to bear the children for my husband i you know it, there's a worth there's a value yeah there's a connection of identity there like as a, as a mother you know you feel fulfilled yeah to, to just have have kids it's kind of like built in you yeah and nowadays, I know nowadays is you know it's a, it's a different thought process, and you know children are a hassle. But if we thought that day, you might not be sitting here today, yeah. You might not be sitting here today. And so this goes on, and you know we we know the story, right? It was preached last week. It talked about how Hannah would cry before the Lord, and uh, uh, he he uh, she she was uh, just praying praying before the Lord and asking the Lord to to grant her this. This baby, yeah, to just, uh, and, and so in verse 11 of uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you only look at your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will be used on his head. Wow. How many of you can do that? I know when I had my son, Caleb, you know, I, I would I could not think that way. I know I know the child belongs to the Lord. How many know that just because you're blessed with a child, it doesn't really mean it's yours. You are called to steward that kid. You're called to train them up and raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And uh 
God can give and God can take away. You re re we've read Job, right? You read Job, right? God can give and God can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so as I put myself in her shoes, it's like, wow, you would, you would give it back to the Lord in that way. And this one does not just say, oh, yeah, just, you know, how, how at church when we have a child, we just dedicate them to the Lord. This one is like full on, like, go. You're going to the temple and we're leaving you there after weaning, of course, after the milk, milk processing stops. And so she fulfilled her vow eventually. That's just so amazing. It, it has to be a God thing because I, I don't think uh, humanly that would be, in a sense, uh, so easily taken to give up your first child and how do you know you're going to get another one yeah how do you know you know this one uh, uh, reminds me of uh, it doesn't remind me but there, there was a, a story uh, I want to share a, a testimony uh, it's a uh, it's an adoption story and uh, it's it's a couple in my church that uh, they tried having kids and they you know, year after year, they, they just didn't. And then so they, they looked towards adoption. They prayed and felt that God led them for adoption. And I'm just going to read what, what they, they wrote as their uh, story. It says, our adoption story began in 2007 when we started the adoption process for one child from China. We went through a, a local adoption agency in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, it was called, International, uh, called Hawaii International Child. They first told us it would take uh, one or one and a half years expedited because of our Chinese descent. So they're adopting from China, they're Chinese, you know, so it was kind of, should, should have been a little bit faster. Fast forward about four years later, it's 2010, still no little girl picked out for us. They said it could be months, years, five or ten, they could not give them a definite time frame. Can you imagine just a couple like, they long to, okay, they made that choice now. We want to adopt. We want to take care of a little girl man, from China. And uh, now it's like we decided and then disappointed. Disappointment. Like year after year they call and, and they continue have to paying the fees and all that. So in July 2010, when we had to renew our paperwork again and pay more fees, my wife felt that God was telling us to stop the process. This is the couple, wife talking. But because I did not hear from God, and in quotes it says, probably because I wasn't listening, and I thought of all the financial and emotional investment we already put in, we should continue the process. But God was dealing with my heart too within the next few months. Then in November 2010, my wife again heard from God to stop the process. But this time, she heard that God will handpick one for us. But I, the man with little faith, thought, how is he going to do that? If not through this route of adoption, is he going to send Mr. Stork and drop off a baby in our front doorstep? But I was submissive to God. So in December 2010, we called our adoption agency and just stopped the process. We were in a peaceful place at the time, knowing God had our best interests in mind. Whether we had a child or not, we were at peace and content. Then came the infamous phone call. Less than a month later, on January 4th, 2011, uh, from, from one of my pastors. Uh, would you like to foster a little baby girl just born yesterday? If yes, come to the hospital tomorrow. My wife said to me, could this be the one? Wow. Think about it now. Some, <laughs> your pastor calls you and somehow in the connection is like, uh, the baby was born. Uh, you can come tomorrow and make a choice. Wow. Kind of fast, yeah? At first, I had some reservations in my mind, my friend said, about her health and, uh, and all. Because the baby, you know, uh, the mother was doing meth and all that kind of stuff, so like a drug baby. But all that changed when we first saw her with all the tubes and all. Our, our hearts melted and, and we said, yes, we want to do this. Then the fostering training starts. Now, you know, usually the process is you, you get licensed, right, for, through the... Through the uh, hui ho'omalu, you, you get the training and they teach you what you need to do and you know what's supposed to happen and the goal of reunification all that all that training kind of stuff comes supposed to come first but this happened before before they got the baby and they made an exception in that case and 
that's that's they testify as another God thing because it doesn't normally happen that way. So now, in July 2011, just about seven months of fostering this new baby is the new excitement, you know. Uh, they get another phone call from the adoption agency. This is the one from China. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Although we stopped the process here in Hawaii, apparently China did not get the memo. And they have assigned you a little girl, 15 months old. Do you still want her? If you do, would you be able to fly to China in about one and a half months from now to pick her up? Yeah, just so easy. I yeah, just pick up and go. In the beginning of our fostering the baby, we had the mindset of, of reunifying her with the biological pres uh, parents. But as the months passed by, it was obvious that the, the biological parents uh, were not able to, did not get the help or they, you know, the focus was not there. And, you know, uh, and uh, she, she was not a priority at the time in their lives. And then so the state asked our friends if they wanted to adopt the foster child. Now fast forward, August 8, 2012, they got to adopt her too. So their testimony is we've been so blessed that God has given us these two precious gifts to steward. People say they are so lucky to have us as parents, being that you know they adopted them. But they say, no, we're the ones who are blessed. We are the ones who are blessed with adopt with these adopted babies infectious smiles uh they have blessed our family so much joy they were uh that's why we we gave gave them a name in chinese hey Yi, which means happy child and our china adopted child we gave the name uh yu yi yun yi which is similar to the name the chinese foster care system gave her when she left their biological parents at the gate of a homeless shelter you know, they, their testimony is, it's been a long wait, but when we let go of our own ways and thoughts, God takes over and he does it his way, which is much more beautiful. My friend's testimony is, he says, in my life, a spiritual truth stands out both in me in finding a wife and having a child, children. The truth is found in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He makes all things beautiful in his time. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, some of you here today, maybe it's it's not the not not the problem of barrenness of not having a child. It could be something else that's out of your control. It could be a sickness. It could be financial. It could be a relational. You know, only God knows. Yeah, but I just want to encourage you today. Our God is a a God who is large and in charge. He knows our hearts. He sees the things that we go through, the struggles, and it's hard. But when we commit ourselves to Him, even what seems so impossible, God can make possible. Even when, we, when we, like the song says, where there seems to be no way, God can make a way. Our brother Jimmy testimony of our grandma is 103. My grandpa is 103. He lives on his own, cooks for himself. And you know, we thought the closing of Seaside was, was a, a bad thing, our, our restaurant in Waikiki. But soon after we closed, uh, just about a month later, I started bringing my mom and my grandpa to church every single week. This is unheard of because it was difficult even in the past when I've tried to bring him to church. You say, oh, no, I got to work. I got this and that and all that. But now, week after week, I bring him to church. And to hear the word of God. Now please pray for my grandpa. He's 103. His hearing is not so good. Okay. He's there. But his, his ear is not able to receive. But he's, he's been given the gospel many times. So it's, it's just a matter of God's timing to really, you know, change. But my mom, my mom confessed, confessed before the Lord. And, you know, she's accepted the Lord. And, you know, she's a taking time slowly growing still dealing with other things but you know she's slowly growing so i praise the lord for that so god truly makes everything beautiful in this time and what seems so impossible god can make possible so today i don't know what you're dealing with i don't know what situation you have and it may seem so impossible for you but again let me reiterate god can make it happen don't give up don't give in Get on your knees and pray. Fast if you have to fast. Pray and God will remember. Like just how he remember prayers of Hannah. How he remember prayers of Sarah. All the prayers of the, of the, the, the women who were barren. He remembered and he answered. 
praise God. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we are just so thankful, Lord, that you are a big God. We want to magnify who you are because you are that great, Lord. The scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of your hands. Let everything that has breath give you praise because you are worthy. And Father, I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters here today. I'm not sure what they may be going through. We know people pass away and those are, it's so hard, Lord God. People get sick. We are not, you know, as even as we are followers of Christ, we are not excluded from sickness. We are not excluded from hardship. We are not excluded from, from de physical death. But Lord, <laughs> greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we're thankful, Lord God, because you provided your son for us, that he paved the way for us, that through his blood sacrifice, even as we have taken communion, we remember that, Lord. Your body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for our sins, that you have made a way, Lord God, where there seems to be no way. Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters and friends here today. I, I don't know what their condition of their heart is. I don't know how close they are to you. But I know the Bible says that when, when we draw close to you, when we draw nigh to you, you will draw nigh to us. You will draw close to us. And so I pray, Lord, Father, that your Holy Spirit uh, just rain down upon each one today, Lord God. And show yourself so real in their lives through answered prayer, through the testimonies of brothers and sisters of what you have done in our lives, that you have saved us and granted us eternal life. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity. And now, Lord God, I, I just uh, place everything in your hands, Lord. Because again, Lord, it's all about you. I thank you, I praise you, and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, Pastor Amen. Praise God. Thank you for that excellent message, brother. And, you know, I got to tell you, I have to think about times in my life when I experienced disappointment. And, you know, I had to think about it, and I realized those times in, when I really got disappointment, you know, to the point where I just want to give up, where it seems like it was hopeless. It was really because I wasn't developing patience in my life. I was being very impatient. I wanted it right away. But you know the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Those that wait upon the Lord, He shall renew their strength. And not so much, okay, when you get impatient, God says, Okay, then I'll give you what you want. No, God says, I'm going to renew your strength. So you're going to know I am with you. And as I give you strength, you will continue on strong. Amen? As you fix your eyes on Jesus, the Bible says he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. As long as your eyes are fixed on Jesus, yeah, your strength from God will come. And he will help you through it. And you will know you're never alone. Amen? Praise God. Why don't we go ahead and bow our heads, let's bow our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this message that you had given to my brother Julio. I knew that you would speak to him. I knew, Father, that this message would truly touch our minds and touch our hearts. And right now, brothers and sisters, if you just heard the word of God and you realize, yeah, you know what? I, I got to learn to be more patient. I got to trust in God more because there are times I let disappointment to rule my mind and my heart. But right now you're saying, Father God, I need your help because I want to be renewed by your strength each and every day that I'm not going to let the devil have his way with my mind and my heart and right now you're saying Lord I know my life is in your hands and I want to trust in you more and more so that as I learn to develop more patience I know when those disappointments will come in my life I'm going to hang on to your word I'm going to hang on to your promises and you're going to see me through it and with all our heads bowed, with our eyes closed right now, you're saying, that's me, Pastor Ben. I want God to take over. I want him to, to completely show me how to live a life that's true to him, that I will not allow disappointment or discouragement to take a hold of my life. If that's the cry of your heart, can you just raise your hand right now and say, that's me, so I can pray for you. Praise God. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, you can put your hands down. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you see now the hands that were raised, but most importantly, it's the hearts behind those hands saying, Lord, that is me. 
And the message that I heard from my brother Julio today, it has touched my heart. And I'm going to see to it that I'm going to hang on to your word tightly. I'm going to hang on to your promises. Because, Father, your promise is you're never going to leave me. You never will forsake me. And that's all I need to know. And I hold on to that. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praises. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.